CharlesEquipment.com. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. Insert Democrat Socialist here. Runs the Democratic House law for 30 plus years of running. He's promising this and he's stealing that. Where can you get that kind of money? He's using your house like his own piggy bank, gang, 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 gang. You ought to know by now. You can pay off your house here in Illinois. But you can never keep up with the taxes. Oh, how it's always been the plan. To have a taxpayer pay, no doubt. Not a matter of if anymore, but when. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. That theme music means it's time for our weekly confab with Ted Dabrowski, president of WirePoints, wirepoints.org, all things Illinois policy related. Ted, thanks for joining us as always. Uh, Good morning, guys. So um, we got a bit of this last week from you, but I saw you were on uh, John Cass's Chicago Way podcast offering more color on your interactions with uh, migrants uh, who are stationed outside of police stations uh, across Chicagoland, talking to Venezuelan migrants, uh, possibly migrants from other countries. And just sort of give us uh, some some more detail on those interactions, the, the perspective of those who have made their way to Chicago one way or the other and are um, living on the streets, waiting for 10 cities or something um, more upscale from the city. Well, you know, I, I heard lots of different stories, and it depends on who you talk to. Um, you know, if, if I think about about this, you know, you arrive. I, I arrived there. I had no idea what to expect. You know, I'm I'm obviously well. I could just walk up, and I walk up to the police station. There's, you know, there's got to be easy 60, 70. I'm, I'm guessing 80, maybe 100 tents across the the front sidewalk of the police station. So you're saying, wow, you know, they really have taken over. And so I just walked up, and I just walked up to a group of men. I took hello, um, got engaged with them. I asked them, what are you guys doing, and uh, you know, how long have you been here? And I just got their stories, and a lot of them had been there for two months. Uh, a lot of them said they've been waiting around just to find out what's next for them. Can they get housing? Um, can they get work papers? It, it, it really was a, a confusion about what the heck they were doing. Um, and, and, and then I met a, a couple families, two, two particular families, one with two little kids, one with one little kid. Uh, you know, they, they had been standing there. They'd been there for eight days. They didn't have a, a tent outside. They were unhappy that all the, a lot of men, a lot of Venezuelan men had tents, but these, these families didn't have tents. Now, they all sleep inside. So at 7 a.m. in the morning, they get kicked out of the police station, and they go back in at 9 p.m. to sleep, and they all just sleep on the floors across the whole police station. Um, oh, I didn't know they had a curfew. So, what time did they get get they get kicked out at seven a.m. and they can't get back until? Yeah, I think it's at seven a.m. Yeah, because so so the, you know it, yeah there it's it's chaos, right? Um, and you know these families are just sitting there on the sidewalks all day, saying, "What do we do?" And of course, they can go to the public library. They can do different things, but they're all kind of waiting around. Uh, they wait around for people to deliver food. People come up with hot dogs and hamburgers, and you know there's there's a lot of uh, volunteer work that goes on, but. But what became very clear is that the city has no plan. And when I talked to some of them, especially the Venezuelans, they said, look, we wouldn't come here if, if we knew we couldn't get in, but we know we can get in. So, um, so we're coming. That was the big message. Uh, they're, they're coming. A lot of them were upset with uh, what happens in Venezuela. As I mentioned, the, you know, the lights don't come on a lot in, in Venezuela. The water doesn't come to your apartment. Uh, you can't make any, any real money. It makes $20 a month is what I was told. And so a lot of them, you know, had fled. But then I heard the other side of the story. And um, there's a woman that works there. And uh, she works at the police station. She's not a police lady, but she is responsible for kind of maintaining order. And you know, she's a little diminutive Mexican woman. And she said that she has to keep those people in, in order because if not, they'll just take over everything. And she says, and here's what she sees. She sees a lot of, a lot of the men are dangerous. A lot of the men are up to no good, a lot of drinking, that kind of stuff. And so they're really hard to manage because once they come into the, into the sleep inside, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to manage. A lot of them will just stay outside because they've been drinking too much. So well, idle hands being the devil's workshop and all. Yeah. Right. 
Well, we have 2,509 in these CPD police districts. And yesterday, four people were taken by ambulance out of the first police district. One was on a stretcher. Cruz said that there's multiple sick people at these police stations. Yeah, I, I don't know how they're going to manage, especially with the weather changing. So the, the, the whole story, it's chaos. There's no plan. And, and you know, it, it invites a lot of dangerous people. It invites a lot of you know, people who are hungry for opportunity. And it's a mixed bag, but uh, it's unfair what we've done because we, we're opening the border, leaving it open. People come here with some kind of promise in their mind, and instead we leave them out in the, you know, out in the sidewalks, no work and, uh, and chaos. Well, it's interesting because uh, I saw uh, at your site as well that um, the uh, Ven- former Venezuelan consul general said, you know, um, we're, the Venezuelans are the majority of the migrants, at least in Chicago, and— um, you know, they're lying about uh, their need for asylum. Um, now, he, he may be flacking for the Maduro regime uh, in Caracas, but that's not really the point. The point is that, yeah, I, I understand um, looking for economic opportunity, and I don't fault anybody for doing that, but we can't just open our borders to every person in the world who is um, uh, unfortunately the, the victim of autocratic regimes that leave much of the population destitute. Uh, Economic opportunity is not a legitimate reason to make an asylum claim, at least not a successful one. But so they know that. And so they don't claim economic opportunity, even if that's all they're really looking for. They're not otherwise failing uh, or or, or they're not otherwise fleeing uh, government repression, like they're going to be imprisoned or tortured or something like that. They're just fleeing economic deprivation. And again, that's an important distinction to make in this conversation. Well, it's a huge distinction because, you know, if we were to make that the the, the, the reason for letting people in, we'd have, uh, you know, a few billion people coming into into uh, America. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know, these people are smart. <clears throat> They're very smart. Uh, you know, they, they are they are many of them are entrepreneurs. They, 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 they look for opportunity. They're risk takers because, uh, you know, if you've spent any time in Venezuela or in Ecuador, <clears throat> Or any of the Latin American countries, you know, there's there's a real lack of opportunity at the at the you know at the, at the American scale, and so they will travel, they will do anything to go find opportunity and be able to to earn a living. So um, I can't fault them for that. The the real fault is is you know Biden at the border. Politicians. The real fault is is yeah, yeah it's Johnson and and Pritzker for not calling for a border shutdown. Uh, you know, they're they're the ones who are being inviting, and then you know we haven't even talked about the money. But, uh, you know, all this uh, news is starting to come out, and the Tribune is done a good job reporting this. I don't usually, um, you know, compliment the Tribune, but, but they're, they're, they're getting the numbers on all this money that's being spent on contractors, um, you know, who are making you know, millions of dollars. And we have no idea if it's, you know, being used well or not, but it's certainly wasted money. Well, like this Garda World thing, I mean, I see more and more. It looks like Brinks trucks, but they say Garda World on it, and they're driving around our neighborhoods. It's very strange. Because they got the they got the contract to build the tents, so are they besides that location at 38th in California? Are there any tent sites that you know that they're starting up? I don't know, but it, it looks like you know, this, this Brighton is getting pretty serious, and uh, people aren't happy. And you know, if you start talking about putting 1,500 people in one site, um, man, yeah, we're, I, I was just telling the story of maybe 100 or plus, I don't know, 150 people in one police station. Imagine putting 1,500 in one site. What that's going to do, and you can understand why, why um, residents, especially those that are in, in, in tougher areas that, that don't do well to begin with, you know, here they are being, you know, one taken over and two being prioritized over. So it's ugly. Uh, I wanted to uh, get uh, uh, an update on this event that's upcoming, sponsored by Nutrient Neighbors, since you are one. Uh, Unsettled Science, Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults. It features uh, Dr. Michael Bailey, who's a, well, Michael Bailey. We don't call non-medical doctors doctors. Michael Bailey. He's a professor at Northwestern, uh, unless he is a doctor. I don't know. Anyway, and uh, Dr. Lisa Littman, who is an MD, so I do get to call her doctor. So Michael Bailey from Northwestern, Lisa Littman, who's an MD, uh, to tackle the topic, gender dysphoria in adolescents and young adults. That's Monday, November 13th, or just uh, two days after our Freedom Summit next month, uh, at the Writers Theater in Glencoe. Is it still at the Writers Theater in Glencoe? It is no longer at the Writers Theater in Glencoe. Uh, what happened? You know, these, these two, 
well, these two doctors, these two professors, uh, they're, they're used to being canceled because they're, they're talking about something that's, a, that's pretty uh, controversial, but it needs lots of discussion. And, you know, they're talking about gender dysphoria. And so, uh, you know, Nutrient Neighbors, we're, we're a, a parent group. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on education because, you know, Nutrier, hey, Nutrier should be one of the most excellent schools in the country. And, uh, you know, we found that in many ways it goes a bit awry on that. And you know, one of the big issues that should be discussed is this gender dysphoria. We've seen a massive, massive increase in, in adolescent girls suddenly um, suddenly claiming they have gender dysphoria. And so Bailey and Littman, uh, we invited them to come speak, uh, Nutra Neighbors, at the Glencoe Writers Theater, which is a great, uh, great venue. Uh, well, you know, they, they accepted it. They accepted our deposit. And then suddenly they said, well, you know, we don't want you anymore. Um, you know, they canceled us. Did they, they say canceled. that or did they say oh, we have a scheduling conflict after confirming the date? Well, right. Yeah, correct. Now, to be more precise, <laughs> what they said is, well, you know what? We, we have an internal board meeting that we forgot to put in our calendar. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. The yeah, that happens. Board meeting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then even, and even more, they didn't say, well, well, we'll give you another day. They didn't say that. They said, we'll help you find somewhere else if you want help. <laughs> oh. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so, so. You know, say what you want. Uh, you know, they, 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 listen, they're a private group. They can do whatever they want. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, they're, they're showing their cards there. And, uh, you know, we, we, we asked them a couple times, listen, will you give us another date? And, you know, they haven't come back. So I think that's a pretty clear message. Now, the good news is, is that we have a backup plan. We're going to meet at the Wilmette Library. Uh-oh. And, uh, no, no. Uh-oh. We'll see if that holds. And, uh, <laughs> We'll meet at the Wilmette Library, and you know, listen, it, it's a discussion that has to be had. It's, it's, you know, and I think not according to a lot of residents of the North Shore, it doesn't have to be had. Yeah, that that's true, but you know, um, it, it should be because the, the the numbers are phenomenal, and uh, you know, Abigail Schreier's written that great book on irreversible damage, covering it, and I, I think everybody should should read that and at least get into the uh, into the arguments of what's going on there. Okay, so that's uh, unsettled science, gender dysphoria in adolescence at young adults, no longer at the Writers Theater in Glencoe. Now, for for now, uh, at the uh, Wilmette Library. Um, I lo- I just lo- I love when the uh, you know hyper educated uh, North Shore residents uh, want to squelch intellectual discussions. It's just so fitting. Hey. You know what you should have yeah. done? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not here to run your group for you, but you know what you should have done? What? You should have said, yeah, we're going to discuss gender dysphoria, but we're also going to do a poverty simulation. Maybe that yeah, yeah, could have gotten past the, yeah, past the goalkeeper there at Writers uh, Theater in Glencoe. Perfect. Yeah. Well, what's fascinating, what's fascinating these, these, uh, these guys, these uh, professors aren't, you know, they're not crazy. They, they, they will talk about the issue and, you know, both sides and ask the questions. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. Well, Northwestern University, you know, I mean, that's just a haven for right-wing zealots, as everyone knows. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Ted Dabrowski, hey, President of Wirepoints. Hey, yeah, I'm sorry. Go hey, ahead. Can I, can I mention one thing? I, I want to make sure we cover one thing. Uh, yeah, this Investing Kids Act that you've talked a lot about. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, that, that's the veto be the session is upon us, right? That's right. And, uh, you know, there's the big fight over 97, 9,600 scholarships. The, the question is going to be whether the Investing Kids Act is kept alive or killed. And if it dies, 9,700 scholarships go by the wayside. And that's, that's really sad because it's a, you know, a lot of low-income kids that get that. But, but here's the bigger story and, and why, why this whole thing is, 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 I don't want to say a joke, is you know, I was looking at the numbers. If you look at 70% of Illinois kids can't read at grade level across the entire public school system. You have 70% of all our kids, is 1.3 million kids can't read at grade level. And here we are fighting over 9,700 kids. You know, the, the whole battle is, is upside down. They've, they've, they've really, Pritzker has got us groveling and begging to him for, for 9,700 scholarships. When across the entire country, you got North Carolina, Indiana, uh, uh, Iowa, everybody's going to universal school choice where every kid has access. Every single kid, no matter what income, what age, what you know, disabilities or no disabilities, they have access to a voucher. And in Illinois... Pritzker's got his begging and groveling to him for 9,700 vouchers. That's what's screwed up. Well, and what's screwed up additionally with that is this thing, the tax cut scholarships uh, are going out with a whimper, not a bang, uh, because in large measure, the opposition is so anemic. Uh, where, where, have we, where, where are the 9,500 parents who are about to lose a scholarship for their kids? Where are their representatives? 
both in public office and outside of public office, other than at wire points or on this program. They've been um, largely absent. They've been too busy, as you say, uh, begging behind closed doors. And that is provocative to uh, the teachers union apparatchiks in charge of the state. There, there's no, I mean, the begging for people that are diametrically opposed to competition in K through 12 is not the play. And that seems to be a lesson that's going to be hard learned, I, I suppose. Ted Dabrowski, President of WirePoints, WirePoints.org, all things Illinois policy related. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Amy. And having Ted on talking about, well, Matt, we never, you know, Loyola beat Mount Carmel. They ended their 22-game winning streak, and there were no reports of any violence or anything, Dan. Isn't that good news? Well, I think most of the North Shore fled to Lake Geneva, thank God. <laughs> it is now safe to come back. They've got, the caravan has gone back to the south side. You can reoccupy your homes, North Shoreans. The more you 